The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hey, Monica. Hey, Jennifer. How are you? I'm actually great. I'm living in my Ocean Grove tent on the New Jersey shore right now. I know. I'm so jealous. The tent looks amazing. Thanks. Do you want to tell our listeners about our guest this week? Oh, my gosh. So we spoke with Marcy Zara, who, if you don't already know her, is an absolute pioneer of the eco-conscious and ethical fashion industry. And she actually coined the term eco-fashion like years ago, back in 95, which was way before anybody was really talking about this. Exactly. So let me just rattle off a few of Marcy's credentials because it's pretty mind blowing. She's the founder of a whopping four fashion and lifestyle brands that are all certified organic and ethically produced. She was instrumental in developing the global organic textile standard, also known as GOTS, and the Fair Trade Textile Certification. She's received numerous awards and recognitions from organizations like Retail Touchpoint, Fashion Group International, and the natural product industry. She's a regular column called The Outside View in Women's Wear Daily, and in 2018 published her first book called Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy, and sustainable world. So if you're at all interested in the intersection of fashion, ethics, and the environment, Marcy is definitely someone you need to be paying attention to. So let's get straight to our interview. Marcy, we're so happy to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer. It's so great to be here with both of you. I know. Last time we saw you, we were so excited. It was like, what, fall of 2019 at the... Before the world fell apart. Yeah. I know, right? Right? (laughs) New normal now. So yes, uh, kind of a new chapter, but a good one for all of us in the work that we're (laughs) doing. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to say I'm in, um, just to preface this, because there might be some noise, because I'm at my beach tent at the Jersey Shore right now, so you might hear some animals or some people walking by, so I just want to put that out there, because it's not normal for me to be in my tent and recording a podcast, but glad to be doing that in nature with, of course, you, Marcy, so that's the the great part. Yes, and I'll just live vicariously through you that you're at the beach, so. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I know. Some water would be good for all of us right now. I agree. Um, Yes. So, Marcy, we did. We all met together, gosh, um, in fall 2019 at the Hearst Tower, right? At Raising the Green Bar, I think was the name of it. It just seems like a million years ago that everybody, (laughs) we would do conferences in person. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. (laughs) And I remember sitting at the table with you and you had that most gorgeous book Mm -hmm. called Eco Renaissance. Um, there it is. <laughs> yep, yep, there it is. It's gorgeous. And um, and one of the things that I think, I don't know if Jennifer told me or you had told me that you had coined the mm-hmm. term eco-fashion, right? Way back when in like 19... 1995, uh, 25 years ago, people thought I was crazy. They said that will never work, Marcy. People who are into fashion are not into the environment and humanitarianism and consciousness and people into a more conscious lifestyle, could care less about fashion. And I was like, wait a minute, but I'm that person. So let's bring those worlds together. Good for you. Was that hard? I mean, of course, I'm sure it's hard in the beginning because when you're a visionary, no one understands you're you're seeing what you're seeing and you're witnessing something that's going to be revolutionary over time. But that must have been really hard for you to get that ball rolling. And here we are all these years later. Now everyone's talking about you are like literally the person behind this whole movement. You know, I don't know if you know this. I actually, um, in 1990, co-founded a school that um, is known today as the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. So I started that. I started IIN out of my apartment. um, And it was because deep in my gut, I knew that the concept of eating a healthier lifestyle, living a healthier lifestyle and eating healthier 
was made so much sense to me, right? So the fact that, you know, the word organic was this foreign idea and that, you know, everyone in the organic world globally knew each other at that time, um, you know, it was a small little niche world. But, you know, in my, again, in my gut, it was always, it was never an if, it was a when. And the same thing with eco fashion, because just like in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our first basic need is food. And then we evolve and we ask, you know, what else, what's next, what more clothing, shelter, right? That's kind of our next basic need. And so it was very obvious to me that eventually, once you plant that seed of consciousness, it will ultimately grow. And that sort of evolution from food to fiber and fashion was something that would be inevitable. And so when I you know, when I coined that term and I started the first uh, sustainable fashion and home brand in North America called Under the Canopy, which was, you know, the premise being that we all live under the canopy of the planet's ecosystem mm-hmm. together. We're all in oh, this together. Yes. And, um, and of course, the canopy is the top layer of the rainforest, right? Where there's more life mm-hmm. living under the canopy of the planet's rainforest than anywhere on our planet. So, you know, it just always for me was um, a natural like, yes, <laughs> you know, and that's where the book kicks off with the first chapter and in, our introduction is all about yes and, right? It's mm-hmm. about the yes and, not or, not, you know, buy it, choose it, wear it, live it because it's that. But live it because it's everything you want and it's that, right? So mm-hmm. you have everything. Mm-hmm. Then it's not about da- sacrifice and deprivation. It's about getting more. And that, so with eco fashion, for me, it was always about a movement, right? To style the world of change and change the world of style and bridge, you know, the tree hugger and the fashionista or the tribe and the boardroom, right? Because I was living in both of those worlds. Well, and th- I, I love, I, first of all, I love everything you're saying. And obviously that's why we're, we're, we have you here today, but the Maslow thing is really interesting to me. Cause, cause I think most of us are sort of familiar with that concept, but, but Jennifer and I were talking like a little bit before, like, you know, food, we, we, we've been, you're, you're so right. Like we, we've, we're very concerned about what we're putting in our body mm-hmm. and we've started to get concerned about what we're putting on our beauty yep. or on our body, like beauty, but mm-hmm. yeah, that the next level, but that's an interesting way to say, this is why we haven't gotten to the fashion yet, or this is why the fashion is coming after these other things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It makes perfect sense now. Cause I'm like, well, why have we, haven't we been? That's so true. I feel like it's been so slow that, that uptick is so slow because journey right, of a thousand food, miles, food. right? Right. That's exactly it. I think the beauty is just kind of touching on the past. You know, I've been in beauty for 25 years. So that transition has been taking so long, but it's still taking faster than faster than the fashion. Now, now that you've talked about Maslow, it really it's connecting those dots I never thought about before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting because kind of that aha for me was when I was, um, I think, 16 years old. And I read a book called Living in the Light by Shakti Gawain, and it struck a very deep chord in me. And um, I, at the same time, my girlfriend who gave me that book, who I talk about in my book, her name is Surya, she was a hairdresser and she introduced me to Aveda when Aveda was one product. And mm. I just was like, oh, that feels so good. It's just like on every cell of my body, breathing in that, you know, that mm. scent of the essential oils and then reading the label and talking about plant-based wisdom and, you know, indigenous cultures and, you know, all of these amazing ancient traditions. But really at the end of the day, it was all about appealing to people at a visceral level and through, mm-hmm. you know, Horst, Fe- the Re- uh, Reckelbacher, the founder, um, who I met when I was still in my late teens, I just was so blown away by his vision. And it just resonated so much for me that we became fast friends. And actually, um, he was my mentor for over 25 years. And um, and we connected those dots on a regular basis between food and beauty in those early years when I was running the school. In yeah. fact, we opened the very first Aveda Concept Salon of, in New York in our school. And oh. I used to teach at the Aveda Institute when it opened in New York. And Horst actually wrote the foreword to my book, Eco Renaissance. Um, and it was the last thing he wrote before he passed away. So food and beauty oh. were kind of this like, yes. And then mm-hmm. watching what he was doing and revolutionizing the beauty and personal care industry was kind of for me that, you know, epiphany of I got best dressed in high school. That's my big, you know, fashion background. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always loved fashion and having that deeper understanding of food and beauty sort of led me down this, you know, 
wow, what I want to do, what horse is doing in beauty, I want to do that in fashion because fashion is one of the largest polluters in the world. You know, you'll hear different statistics, but second to oil and, you know, eight to 10 percent of the world's carbon footprint is coming from the fashion and textile industry. You know, when you add in like agriculture and transportation and all the components and the energy use, um, 20 percent of the world's, you know, freshwater pollution is textile treatment and dyeing. And less than 3% of the world's agriculture is cotton, but up to 20% of the most harmful insecticides and up to 10% of the most carcinogenic pesticides are being used on cotton. And that's other at, that other aha, when you talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is that in agriculture, when you talk about organic agriculture, it's really about the methodology is about crop rotation to build soil health and build the nutrients in the soil. Cotton is a very important crop in, the, in that equation. Um, and in that rotation, and 60% of a cotton plant goes back into the food stream. And this is something a lot of people don't know. 60% of the plant by weight is the seed. And the seed gets broken down and made into cottonseed oil, which is used in, we start reading labels, bread products, snack foods, tons of foods that are on the oh. shelves of supermarkets. So if you're not looking at organic cotton in agriculture, you're looking at an extremely chemically ridden seed and crop that is ultimately being eaten, right? So there's right. your interconnection on, it's not just what you eat, it's what you wear, but it's also, there's so much light, there's so many layers of connection. Well, and we had on um, the chief impact officer, Jeff Catch of Rodale last two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have been very tied into them for years and years and years. Was that something that you found back in the 90s? Yes. And started that relationship then? Because yes. I feel like I, I run into people <laughs> every day who have no idea who Rodale is. And so I've become like their little brand evangelist. <laughs> yes, you are, Monica. I am. I'm with you it, there, Monica. I'm a it, huge fan of it, Rodale. Yeah. It's so important. And um, I had this, we had this amazing woman that was in last week who's a physician and writing a book called On Healing. And I think that's okay to talk, to talk about it. It's coming out next spring. And she was incredible. She'd never heard about Rodale. And so, you know, we introduced her, the head of development was here and they, they got introduced. And so now they're going to have this whole relationship and come visit the farm because, you know, it's just in Pennsylvania, right near you and super close to New York City. So she's just going to get on the yeah. train and pop on down there. So can we go back? Okay. I want to go back to cotton for just a second. Yeah. So no, I'm kind of blown away by this. Keep going. Yeah. So you, <laughs> threw out a t you threw out a ton of statistics yeah. there and I'm like, whoa. Um, so one of the things with fashion, right, is so organic. We go into like the grocery store mm -hmm. and you just see the little label, the organic label on my carrots. And I'm like, I'm going to get the carrots over the conventional and for all the reasons that we know. But how do we know the organic, the cotton's organic in the T-shirt? Yeah, like, no, how great do question. We, what do we do? What do we do there? Yeah. So in the 90s, um, I was on the organic fiber Council of the Organic Trade Association, which I also relaunched um, five years ago and uh, was chairing the next chapter of the Fiber Council. And so now it's really, it's the fastest growing non-food sector in the organic industry right now is textiles, fiber. Okay. Um, fiber. But, okay. but back in the 90s, we discovered through the OTA writing an organic fiber standard that would mirror the organic food standard, you know, the NOP standard, the USDA governed standard. We wrote our version of that for textiles and fiber. And then we realized that Japan had their version and the UK had their version and Germany had their version. And so we all came together. It was one of the first like global collaborations that I was involved in in the 90s. And it was really exciting because we created a uniform standard that would cross all, you know, boundaries and, and uh, country borders. And it's called the Global Organic Textile Standard. It's called GOTS. And so mm -hmm. that seal, the GOT seal, is our counterpart in the textile industry to what you see on food and beauty products, the NOP seal. We cannot use that on textiles because the 5% allowances for the 95.5 rule or the, even the 70-30 rule do not account for dyes, finishes, and sundries and all the things we use in textiles. They are very oh. food specific. Will, so, will you stop? Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> for our listener, I'm going to assume that they're where I am. Like, I know enough. Wait, what's the 95 5 rule and what's the 70 30 rule? Yeah. So to call a product organic, 
but this is law. This is federal law. This isn't like a, you know, marketing proposition of any kind. This is, this is the NOP governed by the U S government, you know, the U S uh-huh. department of agriculture. So you have to be at least 95% certified organic ingredients to call a product organic. And the other 5% have to be listed on the approved substance list of the NOP or the national organic standard, right? That's okay. when you see an okay. organic food product, that is a consistent rule. The 70-30 rule is if you have up to 70% orga- certified organic ingredients, the other 30% also on the approved list, you can say it's made with organic ingredients and list all, everything that's mm. organic. You cannot call the full product organic. Okay. So we God, I didn't know rule. that at all. Yeah, so we have a similar rule with GOTS. We, if we're 95% certified organic fibers, cotton, wool, silk, linen, right? Then, and Mm -hmm. the other 5% are on the allowance list, meaning in our world, no formaldehyde, no heavy metals, no acetones, no optical brighteners, no chlorine bleach, like all the things that you're not allowed to use is kind of like saying on the food side, you're not allowed to use certain preservatives or chemicals or additives and synthetics. So we have our version of that. So the 95.5, where we can say this is an organic shirt, an organic towel, an organic jacket, organic dress. It has to be at least 95% certified organic. And the the organic fiber that we're using is certified to the exact same methodology as a food standard, right? Okay. So at the agricultural level, they're the same. And it has to be NOP certified at the agricultural level. It's the finishing, dyeing, processing, producing of the finished product. Because we're not selling. Actually, if you're selling cotton balls and cotton swabs, you can use the NOP standard. Because there's not, nothing else in it except an agricultural product. But if you're uh, going uh, into a textile product, a home or an apparel textile, that's where GOTS comes in. Wow. Okay. okay. So that- <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, you go. You go. You go, Jennifer. I don't even know, like, there's so much I want to ask. But, well, I'm just thinking about, like, going into the store and trying to figure out where these labels are. I'm going to go say something because I'm going to go back. But I'm even thinking about, like, all the bad things with fast fashion right now. Like just what you just said, all of a sudden, like I'm opening my eyes and is thinking all the things that are out there and the, you know, buy it because it's cheap kind of mentality is like destroying um, so much of our world. Like, I don't even, there's so much to ask about that. And like, what does, what does that mean to you when you see like things about fast fashion or I'm not going to name names or anything, but like, yeah. how do you approach that? Or what do you say about that? Yeah. So let's start by saying we have to wear the change we wish to see in the world. Right. And Mm -hmm. when you look at what fast fashion has done, it's been, you know, proliferating, you know, Mm -hmm. like disposable fashion that is ending up in our landfills. It's ending up as, you know, synthetics that are getting washed in washing machines that are then shedding microfibers into our washing machines, into our rivers, into our oceans, destroying the ocean ecosystems, 90% of fish today are showing traces of microfibers. These are tiny, tiny little particles that are endocrine disruptors because they're plastic that are coming Mm -hmm. off of every single synthetic garment ever made in the history of mankind because synthetic uh, textiles do not biodegrade. So number one, to slow down fashion, we have to look at fibers and materials. So Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of organic cotton, regenerative in transition to organic cotton, um, mm-hmm. And now we're also offering biodynamic organic cotton through my company, Eco Fashion Corp. And okay. so we have all three. We have all three tracks. We have organic. Okay. We have regenerative in transition to organic, and we have biodynamic organic. So then okay. we all. I am also a big fan of Tencel Lyocell. And a lot of people mm. don't know what Tencel is. They think it's synthetic. They think it's technical. What is it? It's actually derived from eucalyptus, and it's extracted the cellulose. Um, is extracted and the uh, eucalyptus is grown on managed tree farms where you're not taking away any arable land, right? Um, So it's, um, and it's FSC certified, it's grown without pesticides and chemicals, grown without water. I mean, eucalyptus is like a weed, it grows very quickly, right? Broken down with a non-toxic recycled detergent or solvent made, manufactured in a closed loop system and all the byproducts are used efficiently. So it's a really great story. We call it eucalyptus at Eco Fashion Corp. <laughs> I so love I'm that. I'm a huge fan of that fiber. And then the third fiber that is kind of 
you know, of the three, my least favorite, but it, there's a time and a place for it is um, recycled poly, which is not polyester that's been recycled. It's actually plastic bottles taken out of landfills and then broken down and turned into the fiber source turned into the yarns and used for functional products. So there, there, you know, again, with the microfiber issue, we haven't found the solution fully yet. So, so I'm still, you know, I still try to avoid synthetics whenever I can. Um, but for functional fabrics, um, you know, and for fill, for things like pillows, things like that, you need, you know, you need um, that kind of fiber. And when you say functional fabrics, are you talking about like, like are like, like, like what would tip? Le- like, if you're would- wearing leggings and you need them to I'm- run and work out, not just leggings that are comfortable cotton leggings, because at our brand, Seed to Style, um, which is our QVC brand, we um, we have amazing organic cotton leggings. You know, and I and I look and I see what else is on air, and it's you know it's almost all synthetic. Um, yeah. And you know, I think if if you're looking to work out, you know, there is um, again sort of a function component to that. But if you're not, then I always would opt anytime you can for organic cotton. Of course, it's more breathable too. Well, and that's interesting because this, this material thing, right. And, and you, I heard you on a clubhouse talk and I've told you this, you know, where I learned about sort of the bamboo versus tensile, tensile or tensile, which is, was tensile, tensile. Tensile. Yeah. And you were advising a woman had asked a question. She wanted to start maybe like a linen, like a, you know, bedding company or something. And she wanted to go into bamboo and you were like, well, you know, very kind. And, you know, I think a lot of us have been taught that bamboo is the answer that, 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 but your conversation about that was like, no, 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 no. This one's much better. And then I don't know if it was on that talk that you had, but I've been like, you know, doing a lot of research on the the plastics and I learned about the microplastics and I just sort of fell over because your to your point, like all of our workout clothes and we won't name names, like all of our favorites, right. Have (laughs) plastics in, and I didn't even think about this, but that's why they're stretchy or maybe even our denim has that in it. And then we put them in the washing machine and then all of those microfibers break out and then they end up in the, in the water, um, which to your point, and they end up in the fish and then we're eating them again. And now we have to your point, we, we, there's a whole health conversation we won't even get into, but obviously part of the storytelling, um, um, so I just think it's, it is so interesting to see if you can find that fabric again, is that labeled? Like, how is that labeled? How would I know if I went to target or I went to like, is yeah. everybody using it? How pervasive it, are these new, um, better for us fabric materials? Yeah. So, so we are required by law to, uh, on a care label to talk about what the content is inside of the garment. Right. So okay. there's never a garment that you should buy. You'll never see a garment unless it's like some, you know, black market garment. Um, and it doesn't have uh, the content label in it where it will okay. tell you exactly the makeup of the fiber. And okay. so, um, and to get through customs, if you're importing again, that's, that's mm-hmm. law, you know, your duties are all based on that. Right. So, yeah. okay. you know, and, and going back to what you said about the fish and, you know, microfibers and the same thing with organic, you've got 83% of Americans eating organic food today, at least occasionally. Right. And the biggest buyer right. of organic food in this country today is Costco. Right. It's not you know, I, whole foods yeah. anymore. Right. And, you know, of course right. we have Target and Walmart and Amazon. Everybody's joined the party. Right. Yep. So, You know, you have, I've lived at the intersection of connecting food and fiber. I think that is something that is really important for people to understand. And you talked very, you know, earlier about we're not just what we eat, we're also what we wear. And I I would say, you know, the metaphor that I love to share is this, the soil is the skin of the earth and it's Mm. meant to protect us. It is meant Mm. to absorb, right? In a good way. It's meant to absorb carbon out of the atmosphere. When soil is healthy and it's and biodiversity is thriving, the soil acts like a sponge and actually sucks carbon out of the atmosphere and protects yeah. us through, you know, we don't have all the carbon up in our atmosphere, the greenhouse gases that are being released. And but when you have conventional methods of agriculture that deplete and destroy our soil health, right? Through GMOs and chemical cocktails that go into the soil and break down all that biodiversity, now mm-hmm. the soil no longer absorbs and and has that protects us right so 
on the same note, our skin is the largest organ in our bodies. It's our primary organ for absorption. If you're, if you're, mm-hmm. you know, a beauty person, you know, you know, right. Yeah. We talk that talk about the skin kind of eating everything that's on it. Right. So textiles are so ridden from farm to finished product with the finishes, the, the dyes and all of the things that are used in the growing and sewing and manufacturing you know, are going on our skin and nobody's ever stopped to think, Hey, wait a minute, 70 million people have asthma and allergies and a third of the Mm -hmm. population has chemical sensitivities. And, and we always talk about what we're putting in our bodies, but we're wearing and using textiles pretty much 24 seven. When you start talking about your sheets and your towels and your, Uh, you know, robes and, and everything else. Right. So, you know, you pull the curtain back. Once you unveil the human and environmental impacts of you know, the textile industry, it's, you can think of textiles to me as a food, right? So connecting food and fiber to me is, you know, you're, and think of, we're made of energy. Everything we put in on and around our bodies is an extension of ourselves in the way of also made of energy. So I always say, you know, the first thing that changes when you change your diet is your blood and the way Mm -hmm. it flows and the energy in your body. And the same thing with, to me, you know, it's very, it's, it's bigger than, you know, this, like, let's protect the farmer and worker welfare, which is super important, super yeah. important. It's also, you know, we talk about health and wellness. It really is about a holistic um, view of all of this, protecting our earth and the ecosystems, protecting our global community, protecting the air and water that we depend on, and protecting our own state of health and well-being right. and that of our families. Well, and that's really interesting you say. So I worked on a large packaged goods company that 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 is a um, uh, sustainable company or like, you know, one of the the biggies out there, right? And one of the big, during research as we were going out to do advertising for them, you know, how do you talk about the brand? And, you know, we started out with, you know, thinking, oh, it's all about saving the fish and what you put down your drain is super important and da 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 It did not resonate with anybody. And what we realized was, and it was, you know, the, the female or the moms were the ones buying this product, right? It was all about the health of the family and their children and themselves. And that was the key, you Mm. know, that's what we had to speak to. And I've always held that. I think it's so interesting. And I think you saw this early on is that, you know, not that we don't care about a lot of these external factors, right. And I'll just keep going with the fish, but you're like, I don't, I don't know where the fish are. I don't understand. I don't, you know, and yeah, I don't want the fish to be hurt, but it just has really kind of nothing to do with my life. And so how do we make it, you know, resonate for people? Um, And I think so much of the environmental movement has been this sort of like thing out there that we're saving. Mm -hmm. And even when they talked about like ozone years ago, I mean, still, you know, but like now the ozone, the hole's gone or whatever, you know, it's like, I don't even understand, you know, what it's this nebulous and people are talking about carbon and everybody's like, well, what (laughs) is carbon? Right. I mean, think about it. And they're like, well, if, if we do X, Y, and Z with transportation, we'll be sequestering, you know, so much carbon and we can buy these offsets. And I'm like, Oh, I kind of get it, but it really goes down to health. Yeah. Yeah. Health and and wellness. And I love that you connected that so many years ago. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) You kind of like, you can't see, like, you can't unsee what you saw. So, like, you discovered, I love that you discovered, like, the food and then the beauty. And then you keep, you know, the research and you want to learn more and more. And the more you discovered, the more you can't unsee what you discover. And you have to go, I I need to be that driving force of, hey, we we have to be better for ourselves and for the planet. Like, we have no option. Like, we all make a difference. Everyone. I was just going to say, I mean, the premise of my book eco-renaissance co-creating a stylish sexy and sustainable world is that through the lens of design we can change the world so Mm. when you talk about art and you talk about the language of the eco-renaissance because we're all creators right and then Mm -hmm. I go into food and beauty and wellness and fashion and business right because they're all spokes in the wheel of change and the common theme across this or what I call this eco-renaissance, this rebirth of humanity through the lens of that we're all part of a collective ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, those pillars are creativity, consciousness, connection, Mm -hmm. community, and collaboration. Those are, you know, the principles of each of these sectors and how we can shift their paradigm. Yeah, no. And I, and I think, you know, you had a quote that, that I wrote down before is, 
nature often offers us the most picturesque examples of art forms. And I love this part. And frankly, I think that the stigma in environmentalism comes from the fact that some activists have separated ecology from the creative human spirit. And I love that. And I think, you know, when we talked, like we did like our pre-interview, it's like you, you've been doing biophilic work for all these years and and you live in biophilia and you're just using different language, but, but you've been sitting here and like been really championing the movement since the nineties. And I just think this is incredible. And so what have you seen change this year with COVID? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, what, yeah. how have things shifted and where do you think things are going due to yeah. this awareness now, much higher awareness of health and wellness? Yeah. So, um, you know, my mission 30 years ago was to make the norm, the alternative and the alternative, the norm, right. Okay. And mm-hmm. to meet people where they are yep. and never judge them or, or impose things on them. Right. It was always about, you know, teach by example, even with my children. Right. And one of my favorite quotes is native American wisdom that we do not inherit this land from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And I've raised my kids who are now, you know, in their mid twenties, both Mm -hmm. of them. And I've raised them with a level of not do it because I say so. Mm -hmm understand the why, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you really do, it it takes on a whole different sort of Mm -hmm. life form. You know, you don't feel that sense of sacrifice. It's all about no compromise. It's Mm -hmm. getting more, it's value add, as Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, right? So what's happened with COVID and, and I don't, you know, make light of, of all the suffering and the deaths. I mean, it's, it's heart wrenching. And I, you know, we do, we have an office in India. And so right now, you know, we're navigating a lot of yeah. um, just heartbreak and challenge and what's happening there. Um, but, you know, the, the gift of COVID is that, you know, people weren't able to go outside and they were able to go inside. Right. And inside, again, sort of metaphorically Mm -hmm. to sort of reset their priorities and Mm reevaluate what really matters and, you know, open back up to family and love and, and, and health and wellness being so paramount Mm -hmm. because the healthier you are, the stronger your immune system, likely the more, you know, you know, the less vulnerable you are to germs, to bugs, right. Which is the whole same philosophy with organic agriculture, right? The stronger we make the soil, the stronger the plant is, the stronger the plant is, uh, more it's resistant to bugs, right? Yep. The bugs want to infest on the weakness, mm-hmm. right? The germs, right? That's the same with us. So I think there's this like awakening that's happened, which of course my book being, you know, about a transformation, you know, a renaissance is a rebirth, yes. right? And this awakening that we all are connected globally. Like we, I mean, if you would have told anybody two years ago that the entire world would be on lockdown together, right? Like yeah. connect. I mean, it's just surreal. But I think what it's done is it's it's you know forced people to reset their parties and recognize that what really matters. And you know, as a as an entrepreneur, I've always said you know people, planet, profit, passion, and purpose. Right? We all know you know the, the three or the five P's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think you know on a personal level, so many people have been living their lives so splintered. Their professional values yes. and their personal values mm-hmm. have been disconnected. And I think people are now bringing those together and recognizing that you need to be in alignment Mm -hmm. in your values in order to be balanced and grounded and fulfilled deeply because we're not outside of nature. We're a part of nature, right? We have a symbiotic relationship with nature. Talk about carbon. We breathe out carbon and nature breathes it in, right? And nature breathes out oxygen and we breathe it in. So we have this relationship. And I think people are, are realizing finally that, you know, it does matter. And so, and the next generation is, you know, changing the game, right? They've they've been raised with all this like political, economic and environmental collapse across everywhere they look. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's so much negativity out there. They're just hungry Mm -hmm. for something positive and transparency, of course, is the new name of the game because They can ask the questions, what's in my food? Who made my clothes? How are they being made? You know, who's making them? And they want answers and then they want 
vote with their dollars. So I think it's, it's game on now. What's the future look like then like for clothing, right? So, so you am seeing more about the fiber, the fiber shed, um, you know, where it's coming from, but the ingredients are, if you will, of clothing, right? Because to your point, it's not just like, oh, here's a carrot out of the ground and these guys are organic. Um, you know, this, whatever I have on here, God forbid. Now I'm like, oh, I got to go look at the label. Um, you know, it's got the fiber, it's got the thread and the thread might've been dyed. Right. And then, um, I don't know what else kind of went into it to make it softer or more resistant, or I don't even know. Right. So is there going to be, you've got the care label. Great. So kind of the, the number that things are on there, but I don't even know what those things are sometimes. Like to your point, if I, if I hear tensile, like maybe I thought that that was a, not a natural fiber. Sure. So what, yeah. what's the future? Is there going to be like a nutrition label? <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple things happening. First of all, it's what's very exciting about what's happening in this, in the global sustainable fashion and textile industry is there's a lot of collaboration and innovation underway. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it used to be, and I, I laugh about this, you know, in my early years coming into eco fashion, you know, in the sort of late nineties, mm -hmm. I used to feel a bit schizophrenic because I would go from like the natural product industry trade shows where it's like, I've got your back. We're all in this together, you know, or mm -hmm. shared vision. And then you'd go to the fashion trade shows and it would be like, watch your back. <laughs> you. you know, like it, there was so much like fear and like, you know, and just like sure. negative energy. And, you know, and I used to just be like, okay, again, how do I, you know, bring these worlds together? So now what's happening is not only, you know, in this country, but globally, some of the biggest companies in the world are sitting at the table together. And, you know, I'm on the board of an organization called the Textile Exchange okay. and was one of the founding members, you know, 20 years ago and um, have been on the board and, you know, since the day one and still vice chair of the board now. And, and it, I love that. I love TE because we're all together talking about solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And that it's like Albert Einstein said, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them, mm, right? True. So it really takes a shift in consciousness and the fashion industry systems are so broken. Yeah. You know, a shirt, a jacket, like you're wearing can change hands seven to 10 times in a supply chain. So going back to what you said, there's so many touch points to look at. It's fiber materials, yeah. processing, it's, you know, minimizing water use and, and energy use, looking at renewables or transportation, carbon insetting, carbon yeah. offsetting, you know, I mean, like we are looking at every which way we've made a commitment through the textile exchange an industry-wide commitment in the textile world that we're going to reduce our carbon footprint 30 or 45% by 2030. That okay. is an wow. industry commitment that we've made. So now it's, you know, all the biggest companies out there, you know, whether you're Target or Amazon or H&M or, you know, carrying. So high market, high end market luxury to, you know, mass market. Um, everybody is now, you know, recognizing that it's not about staying ahead anymore. It's about not being left behind. If you are not embedding social and environmental accountability into your business models, you're going to be out of the game. It's, it's really, I mean, you could see already how many retailers during COVID have, you know, folded and it's mm -hmm. unfortunate. They just didn't keep up with the times. They were no longer relevant. And this, this, you know, level of accountability is, is no longer just an add on. Mm -hmm. It's actually being demanded by today's consumer. Right. And that's only going to get bigger because if, you know, last year the OTA came out with, you know, 52% of organic shoppers are millennials. And the number one reason that people often embrace an organic lifestyle is when they have kids mm -hmm. and a lot of the millennials, most millennials haven't had kids yet. So you think about the trajectory wow. for the organic lifestyle, it's only going to grow. That's and the so... next generation is already showing that they they want sustainability as a mandate. Oh, that. and that makes so much sense because that's exactly when we started really focusing on organic more was when we had kids. Like we were always pretty healthy, but we really dialed it in when that happened. But that's so interesting. So they're just, so so what where I am, right? Like we sell houses at Sarah and B, right? And so- the millennials are buying like crazy right now because they're all coming of age. I think the top age is like around 40 now and they're all starting to buy their first home or even moving into their second home. And they're starting to have those kids to your point. And so the nature based mm -hmm. need, I mean, we're seeing it across the country of like, I want a single family home. I want something that feels safe. I want it connected to nature. I want, you know, connected to people, but you're right. If they haven't started having the bulk of their children yet, yeah, 
Just wait. Wow. Yeah. And the only upticks in agriculture in the farming communities in the last handful of years are from the millennial generation that are kind of moving back out to the farms right. and reinventing the farms to be organic. And, you know, that we did a study called the Hotspot Study that showed that where there are pockets of agric- organic agriculture in America, household incomes are, are up over $2,000. Poverty rates are decreasing. Communities are thriving. Farmers are making, on average, 35% more money. I mean, it's a system that has a good business economic model, mm-hmm. not just good for people and planet. So wow. that's the win-win, that's the win-win-win. It's good business to do well by doing good in the world, right? Like, And that's why, you know, my brands at Eco Fashion Corp, we really hang our hat on organic agriculture, connecting organic you know, agriculture to popular culture. So, so right? where, so, yeah, yeah. So, where do we find your brands? Like, where, where, where can we shop? Because we know everything that that we can buy from you will be the smart choice. So, t- oh, tell me, yeah. you mentioned QVC. Tell me everything about where we can yes. find you. So, so first of all, um, we have a B two B manufacturing arm to make sustainability easy for other brands, retailers, um, companies looking to create. Camp so they can campaigns. call you. So you want to make t shirts or hoodies, or you want to make a full fashion collection. You want to make a home brand. Whatever products and textiles, we're equipped. We have an office in India, a whole team on the ground, manufacturing platform, and we can make any kind of apparel or home, private label, mm-hmm. all customized and certified with full transparency. Oh, I marketing love that. Baked yeah. in from source to story. Think of it as like the Intel inside wow. of sustainable fashion. And, and, and what's the name of the company? Metaware. So metawareorganic.com is, okay. is um, how you find more about I love Metaware. that. Okay. And, and, you know, we make, we make product for, you know, all kinds of companies from, you know, Dr. Bronner's and, mm-hmm. and Garden of Life and, and Four Ocean all the way to some of the biggest retailers in the country. And therein lies where QVC comes in. Mm-hmm. My first meetings with QVC were just concept. You know, we want to make wow. you the Martha Stewart of an eco lifestyle. We want to, you know, really build a platform that taught that where you can educate and activate our, you know, our viewers and our, you know, our customers. And, um, and it's almost like, you know, for me, a dream come true to be able to go on air in front of a hundred or 200,000 people a minute or whatever the number is yeah. and, and talk about guts and farmer welfare and, you know, free of all the harmful chemicals and good for you ethically made and, you know, in front of like on air nationwide. Amazing. So we have two brands that we created for QVC that are uh, recently launched. One is called Farm to Home. Okay. And it's 100% GOT certified organic bedding and bath, all affordable, accessible, and authentic. Okay. You know, fully traceable to the GOT standard. And then we have a sister brand called Seed to Style. Mm-hmm. And Seed to Style is the most um, a size inclusive and affordable, sustainable fashion brand you'll find anywhere. Yeah. And so we go from sizes extra, extra small to three XL. Yeah. Everything is between the price right now, $30 to $70. Nothing's more than $70. Super accessible. So mm-hmm. it's super affordable and accessible, really high quality. So the really great fabrics, we do all modern, you know, contemporary prints and tie dyes and animal prints are really in now. And so we're on trend, mm-hmm. but we're, you know, seasonless, timeless, ageless, um, inclusive and affordable. So it's not why would you buy organic fashion? It's why wouldn't you buy organic fashion? Yes. You can have everything you want. I'm just so glad that QVC gave you this platform to really kind of yeah, elevate the awareness. How long have you been on QVC now? We launched uh, Seed to Style on January 29th. And so we launched Farm to Home just before COVID hit. Uh, and then we had all these logistical issues during 2020 because okay. our factory shut down sure. and, and lockdowns and whatnot. And then came back on air um, again at the end of 2020. And then, you know, with Farm to Home, new collections rolling out right now as well. Um, but if you go to qvc.com, you could either watch it on air or you could go to qvc.com as well and search Seed to Style and Farm to Home and you'll see all the products. You can even watch me on air in the little, you know, <laughs> a box. You know, I love online. it. Um, and then we also have a contemporary uh, direct-to-consumer brand at Eco Fashion Corp called Yes And. Again, so oh, I love, I love it. Inspired, okay. by, inspired by my book. And the URL is joinyesand.com. 
And at joinyesand.com, we it's all about the movement. And we do a lot of co-creation and collaboration. We actually call it eco-creation. Mm. And we collaborate with other organizations. We just did a collaboration with the Rodale Institute. I saw where- those t-shirts. I That's love that. Really, really cute. And so MetaWare designed and developed with Rodale and, and Hannah Eddy, the artist. And Yes And is retailing them side by side with Rodale in their store. So, oh, that's fantastic. Um, so we go all the way from farm to consumer with Yes And. And again, it's all about no compromise. Yes, everything you want, style, quality, fit, color, comfort, hand, price, and certified organic, ethically made, fair trade, circular, recycled, all the good stuff. Oh my God. Well, Marcy, this has been a joy. I feel like it's a fire hose, um, but I absolutely <laughs> loved it. I so learned so much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is there any last thing you want to add before we go? Or <laughs> is there anything? I could talk to you for another few hours, Marcy. I really wish we had the time with you to sit and chat. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, it's really about if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And you know, you know, it's 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 being a, joining this movement and having fun. And and you know, that's why the book is really meant to be very user friendly and tips and tricks. I have 41 people I highlight in the book that I call my Illuminatists. These are people that are you know also paving the way and leveraging their own platforms to affect positive change in the world. So we're all in this together. One plus one equals eleven. Right. And yes. horse, horse horse birthday was eleven eleven. I got married at his house on his seventieth birthday at eleven eleven eleven. So that power of that it, it really symbolizes for me co creation. Mm-hmm. We're stronger together than we are apart. Yes. Right. One hundred percent. Thank you, Marcy. This is beautiful. Honestly, like what a fire hose of information that I'm just overwhelmed with. Like I'm going to have to go back into understanding the cotton even more because my mind is really kind of blown right now, but thank you for sharing your wealth and your depth of information and your years of experience and knowledge in the subject has really been so, um, I can't unsee what I'm just learning from you. And I think that's the most powerful part, right? Like we have to continue this torch of information. And that's why I'm so thankful you came on with uh, Monica and I today to discuss everything. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both for having us. Super fun. I can't wait to come down to Serenby. Oh, yeah. We've uh, got more visit. We're ready for you. We need to do a pop up. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Next chapter. Okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks, Marcy. <laughs> Have a great day, you guys. Bye. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye. Um, all right, Jennifer. How do we wrap this one up? <laughs> I truly don't even know where to start. I know. So, what was something that you learned that you didn't know before? Okay, I guess the thing about cotton is what comes to mind. It has a reputation as being a natural fiber, so therefore it should be good, right? In actuality, the majority of cotton is grown non-organically with pesticides, so it's really harmful in terms of water usage, chemicals, and human impact. And then because there's so much water waste in the process, the chemicals come back to us via the water supply. I need to do more research for sure, but there are all these levels of impact from, you know, a single cotton t-shirt that we think we're so insulated from, but we're really absolutely not. Yeah, that totally stood out to me as well. And it speaks to the larger point that Marcy made. She talked about how we need to have a more holistic view about how all of these things impact each other and the environmental impact, the human and community impact, and the impact on our own health and wellness. Right? You know, the problems with fast fashion seem so immense. Like, how will we ever divest ourselves from that level in consumerism as a society? But I also think she is totally right that consumers themselves are demanding more accountability, especially we are seeing with millennials and younger. From the brands and from our business perspective, cutting corners is just a bad practice at this point because people will simply stop buying your products. Yeah. And it reminds me of her yes and mentality that Marcy talked about. You know, we don't have to sacrifice style to be environmentally conscious and you don't have to sacrifice environmentalism to be fashionable. You really just have to educate yourself about the clothing brands that we choose to invest in. And more and more people are holding companies to a higher standard, which is really great. Well, per usual, this was a fire hose of information. If you want to learn more about eco fashion or check out Marcy's brands and book, head to our show notes. Yeah, and I'm going to have to go dig through my closet and see what's really in there. Me too. (laughs) See ya. Bye.